guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shot episode 201, featuring the third slice of my interview with Mr. Jeff Tunnell, the founder of Dynamics. This part of the interview, we talk about betrayal at Crondor, incredible machines, trophy bass, uh, the educational games that Dynamics made. I think you'll find that really interesting. Uh, we also talk about the uh, or what Jeff thinks about patents in software and games. So a lot of great stuff in this episode. So without further ado, here is Mr. Jeff Tunnell. All right, so Chris Putnam uh, says he wrote in, so I'm talking about how much he loved uh, the Incredible Machines, and I'd like to know the inspiration behind it. And also, just on a personal note, I have to say that that's uh, one of the few games that my my wife <laughs> you know, played and loves and talks about. One of the few uh, games, so definitely want to talk about sort of the origins of that game. Sure, um, that actually the idea for the Incredible Machine probably came in 1985 or something like that. It was that at the time there were um, a lot of the popular games there was pinball construction set and music construction set and and we were I think Damon and I were having a beer one time and he says you know we should make a little machine construction set and he was just and it just stuck in my mind I was like oh yeah we should do that and uh, and so it was actually Damon's <laughs> original idea there and then I just but I ran with it and I started making designs and all that kind of stuff and and, I, and the reason I know is like 1984 or 85 is because the original designs that I have are printed out on a dot matrix printer from like one of those Macintoshes that had the, like, the little teeny black and white screen, and and uh, so I had written up the original design there, and we shopped it around a little bit. I tried to get um, Epics to buy it and a few other, uh, not buy it, but publish it, and we would be the developer, but it we just never could get it signed, and it was the computers weren't powerful enough then anyway, so. So that, but that was the first title that I said, okay, we'll do JTP. I, the first thing we're going to do is is the Incredible Machine, and uh, you know the great story about that is that uh, Kevin Ryan was my partner at Dynamics, and, and he was working with me still at JTP, and uh, we made we he he programmed that game in nine months from the. the Original conception until we released it was nine months. It had a thirty-six thousand dollar budget, and so it was it was amazing that that we were able to pull that thing off. And it was so it like I said, we just couldn't do the original ideas, but the PC allowed us to do it. And even there, we were really pushing the envelope, but pushing the envelope with little teeny graphics. If you remember the the original Incredible Machine shipped on one three and a half inch floppy. Floppy. <laughs> it was, I mean, they were they were hard, but they, we called them floppies. But they, and, and so it was it was pretty amazing. But then from there on, there were very very few changes to that core code from the from the time we shipped it for for the next seven years or so that we came out with new versions of the Incredible Machine because uh, for some reason everybody got it in their head that that the Incredible Machine should have been selling. As well as uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Because Ken's, you know, best friend or friend that was Doug Carlson was running Bruder Bond, and it, they had kind of had this little thing going, and you know, who who had the the best company, and 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 our our little player in there was the Incredible Machine, even though you know Carmen San Diego was getting huge, way more marketing and so forth. We still sold millions of copies of of the Incredible Machine over its lifetime, but. But it is interesting to see, think that it was still written on that incredibly inspired nine-month period by Kevin Ryan. Must have been a heck of a good beer you were having that night. It was. It, I'm sure it was a good beer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it blows my mind too that a publisher, that any publisher, could look at that game and, and that design and not just recognize a hit. Yeah, it, it's just if you think about it though. Like I said, we were all making all kinds of experiments back in those days. That was why it was so great. Early '90s, it was just we. The genres didn't even exist then, you know, a little bit of RPG going, a little bit of simulation, but everything else was was wide open. And so if a game didn't just go out and just like explode, it just didn't, you know, people would think that well, we don't need to put more in that one. But but again, I've got I've got folders of ideas of things that I always wanted to do for that game and we just couldn't do it. You know, because I, I it wasn't a publisher, I mean they owned us. It wasn't we worked for Sierra, and so you don't, you know, you don't also realize that when you're inside a big company, you have to push really hard for your products and your ideas to bring them to market. A lot of threats, you know. You get the end. Threats? Oh yeah, like, 
if if you think that the marketing company the marketing department's doing a bad job on a game that you absolutely love and, and you know and I'm on the product development side and you know and all the, everybody's looking to me like oh we've worked on this thing for 2 years and we put our lives into it and now they're going to cr- screw up the marketing and then, you know then it would be like oops are you still there <laughs> <laughs> I just bound my fist on the table and made your thing go away. So um, it, it was just uh, if I, I would just say I don't know how to put this. They would they would come across like with the wrong marketing idea and and they'd say, well, this will make it sell. And I said, if you want it to sell, just put tits on the box then because <laughs> that'll make it sell. You know, I mean, don't come back to me with that. Give me something that give me something that my audience wants. That's a whole stuff. different incredible machines. What's that? That's a whole different incredible machine. Yeah, that would definitely be. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta mess with this. Hold on. Okay, so uh, 1993 is when we get Sid and Al's Incredible Tunes, which I understand that earned you, you actually got a, a patent of some sort on that. I was kind of curious, uh, what, what, what's the story behind, behind the patent, and then maybe and just what your thoughts are on the whole patenting in games. Oh, I, I, think, I think patenting software in general is a crime. Um, crime. Sierra, a what? A crime. A crime. Yes, I, I think it is. Um, the we, you know, I wasn't pushing for that. That was a a point where now Sierra is a publicly traded company, and they're trying to, you know, they they just had patent lawyers running around the company looking for all kinds of different things that they could patent. And you know, once they decide to do that, if you they they owned us, right? So they so you work with these guys, and you get this stuff patented. You know, on the on the. The bright side, I guess, is my name is on a patent, and so is Chris Cole. But I don't. I'm not proud of that in any way. I mean, I'm proud of the design, <laughs> the idea, and all that. I like that, but but the idea that it's patented, you know, it's 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 silly. I I, I don't think that software patents are too obvious. If you're in this business, you're thinking ahead five years, and you you, you know all these things you're going to do, and you, uh, Small guys don't have the the resources to go out and patent it, so I, I think it's I think it's a horrible a horrible system and it's holding us back. What was your role in Betrayal and Crondor? I had Neil Neil Hofford on uh, recently. And he, I think he might have been the one that mentioned that I should get you on the show. <laughs> you know, oh. I talked to you. I just kind of wondering what you th- what you thought about the Betrayal and Crondor. Um, well, actually, I was really instrumental in in bringing Betrayal at Crondor. Into development, and marketing, and the whole thing. Um, I we had our three D technology for you know driving a tank around on on terrain, and I thought you know what if we just if we we could put a lot more stuff out here, and and do it kind of like a golf game, you know, like it pass through a role playing game. So I thought we could we could um, get a pretty nice looking scene in full three D, and so that was the technology piece of it that enabled it. And then um, from there, I, I, um, I just went out and read a whole bunch of um, books, fantasy books, and found that Raymond Feist book, Crondor, I don't remember the name of it, but it's, uh, it was Magician. Yeah, yeah, Magician Apprentice. And I loved it. And it turns out that those stories were, um, they... Raymond Feist and all of his friends would sit around and play like some kind of their own version of D&D or something like that. And so he wrote these stories to, to back it up. And so it was kind of made for games. And But I, I looked, I, I don't know, I must have read a hundred different books. And that one was, I just loved that one. So so we went and licensed that and then we needed a designer. So I got John Cutter to do that. And then we needed a writer. So we got Neil and, and it was and so it was a great team. We put this great team together, and then beyond that, I didn't I didn't work on it too much, other than in a producer capacity. Um, John did all the design, and Neil did all the writing. And so it was a good team, and and ended up selling really well. And so we were able to do a couple others. I wanted to talk about some of your educational games too. Yeah, uh, I mean that topic doesn't come up enough on in interviews, I, I think, but. I just uh, you know, it seems like such a challenging genre to get right. You know, how do you make a game entertaining, and at the same time, t- you know, teach your kids something? So, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the best way to do it, the the most educational and the best educational product that I ever did was the Incredible Machine, um, because it's so naturally um, educational. And then we did some like Mega Math and Turbo Science that were more uh, 
we were just trying to get our foot in the door and see what it was like to do educational products. And, and also, I had young kids at the time, so I really wanted to make educational products. And um, but the, the like I said, the Incredible Machine is is my answer to if if you really want to make great educational stuff, do it like that. Give kids a sandbox, and then we wrote a curriculum around it, and we had professors testing it and that kind of thing. That's why the Incredible Machine was in so many schools. And I think that 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 one I'm incredibly proud of. The the more drill and kill stuff that we did, like. Um, Turbo Science. Uh, I mean, they were good products, and they used our adventure game engine. And, and uh, but they, it, it and, and even when I did them, I knew that we were doing drill and kill. But I thought, oh, if we can just establish a market because they were selling. You know, the educational market was really huge back then and growing incredibly fast. And and if you remember looking at things like Davidson's Math Blaster and stuff, they were they just weren't that great. Even though you know Davidson made a billion dollars when Sierra bought them, it's. Uh, I didn't think the products were that great, so I thought, all right, well, if, if they can do that, maybe we can do that, and we can get some money, and then we can do more things like uh, hype, you know, make incredible machine type products for for the educational market. But you know, by the time we got through that dynamics and the educational market started imploding, and the reason for that was, um, you remember, everybody was all of a sudden everybody had to come out with everything your first grader has to know in a box, everything your second grader has to know in a box. And, and that was, <clears throat> that was the, the beginning of the end of educational software for a long time. I mean, kind of feel a little bit of it coming back and, and when I see little kids playing on iPads and so forth, it, it kind of gets my juices flowing and I'd like to do something like that. And that's why, you know, one of the offshoots of contraption makers, we can do a you know junior inventor version, or we can do a an educational version, and <clears throat> and so I'm sure that we will end up going down that road a little bit, but for a long time, what we were out of the, the educational market was pretty much taken over by things like Leapfrog and things like that, the standalone standalones, um, because the we just pretty much I mean the only thing you can say is we shit in our bed, <laughs> it, it, the the edu all the educational companies just they just pumped crap into the market and lost the faith of the parents. And, and once you do that, then you have to start all over again. And it, but you can feel it twitching. It's kind of coming back now. Uh, so 1995, this must have been a huge year, year for you. I, I was kind of wanting to, I was looking at some of those Load Runner games uh, in the bio. It's only called Load Runner Online. I wasn't even aware of this. The Load Runner Online, the Mad Monk's Revenge. You know, so yeah. this was like like the the people would make their own levels and share them, or how, how did this work? No, it it was more that you could play our um, our technology for doing multiplayer games was getting better and better, and so we were able to put little things like you could have multiplayer load runner and that kind of thing. The way we got into load runner was you know that that was an early early hit, not for for us but for Bridbund and um, a guy that was doing. Um, a bunch of presage was the name of the company, and Bill Holt was the um, was the CEO there, and they got the rights to Load Runner because Doug can't remember his name, the the guy that actually did the original Load Runner worked for them, and he and he called me up one day and he said, "Do you want to do you want to do something with Load Runner?" And I thought about two seconds, said, "Yeah," <laughs> and so it I mean in that one it was more just pure producer mode uh, working with those guys. Let's figure out a unique positioning for this thing, and, and uh, they did a beautiful job for it. Um, I can't take a whole lot of credit for that one, other than being able to, you know, get money and a green light and, and help them strategize the game. But it worked really well for us. And so did Trophy Bass, right? I noticed that one on there. So I, I love those fishing games. I don't. <laughs> it was kind of like a guilty pleasure, I guess. They really were fun. You know, we didn't think they were going to be that much fun when we first started them. Um, I we did Trophy Bass because. Um, the way it worked was I, I was in a, a pretty high-level meeting once, and the sales manager for all of Sierra came in, and he said, yeah, these fishing games are selling in Japan on the Nintendo. And at the time, I, I said, everybody's laughing. And I, I'll do it. Um, because I thought, you know, what the heck, for the next year, we will have a lifestyle of being able to go out fish. And all this I was wondering if you were a fisherman too. And uh, I don't know if I was a fisherman, but not a you know not hardcore. But you know, fished a lot when I was a kid. And um, and so it was just for me. It was more like, hey, I will do this because then 
then you then you have the backing of the sales force before you don't even have to go in and sell them on the on the idea they already you already have the backing of the of a big part of the company and so so that's what we so we went ahead and did it and oh my goodness that one was a, a surprise sleeper hit that I mean it, it surprised everybody in the company but the sales force so it was it was fun I it, it was a great product and and that's actually one that does need to be made again I think that um, fishing games have been all messed up and and you know you you need a really good fishing brand that works on PCs and tablets and so forth so you know someday maybe we'll we'll see if we can get something going there. What do you think is wrong with the modern ones? Um, well, first of all, they went 3D, and that actually messed them up. It, it wasn't really the same fishing experience. It was more like a go underneath the water and see your fish out there and all that kind of stuff. And it, it just and they became too arcadey. They there's just a whole bunch of things that uh, I don't know. They just don't feel right to me. Well, then uh, 1996, we can start to get the 3D. Ultra Pinball, and I think you said that one was your best hit. Yeah, ever, actually, right? it, it it was, and and that was another one of those where because because of the incredible machine where I was just incredibly proud of it and and thought these are, this is the game that should be selling, but it was like inside the company it was always pushing the rock up the hill. It was like that like again, you know, threatening to quit all the time because if you're not going to support this, I'm going to go make it myself, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, so the but the so I just said pinball game. Let's just let's do something really simple that everybody understands, and and it was the right call. And and then you know I had some really interesting stuff at the time. We we used three D modeling for all of the the um, graphics in it and that kind of thing, which was a really really big deal at the time. It, it wasn't you know nobody had done that kind of thing, so it had a really unique look. Um, the design of it having. A pinball table here and little ones over on the side uh, was just a. It was a really good design and it, and it just worked. And we were able to follow it up every year for the next four years, and every one of them sold well. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part four, the fourth and final installment of my interview with Mr. Jeff Tunnell. Got a lot of stuff to cover, including a certain game called Tribes. So stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you very much if you have supported the show. It really makes a huge difference, guys. Don't need a lot of cash here. Just one dollar per episode works just great. Go to armchairarcade.com for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner. You can set that up in as little as five minutes, maybe even fewer, and it makes a huge difference. Also, guys, if you uh, mention me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, any of those things on your blog, uh, that also makes a difference. And, of course, you can always participate by leaving comments here on, uh, on YouTube or at uh, iTunes. Uh, you can leave reviews there. Or, of course, uh, talk about it on Armchair Arcade. So lots of ways to connect here. Also have a Facebook Matt Chat group you can join. You're more than welcome to join that. Uh, not exclusive in any way. Okay, what about that ale of the week? Uh, now, the local Coburn's grocery store has a, they've been sort of expanding into maker, or micro brews, <laughs> yeah, micro brews, uh, lately, and there was a guy there named Reese, uh, who I guess is their purchaser, uh, so he was giving me all kinds of information about the, the ales they have there, and he pointed this one out and wanted me to do it on the show, so I thought I would uh, take his word for it and see, you know, see, see if it's any good. This is a Stone Ruin Tin IPA. That is a, uh, apparently they use something like uh, four pounds of hops or 200 pounds. Of, anyway, some in, insane amount of hops to make this. Uh, it's 10.8% alcohol by volume, so uh, quite strong. Uh, there's a huge uh, write-up here on the back. I'm not going to read that. <laughs> uh, but it looks like they take their beer uh, very seriously. And I've had, have, I've had a lot of other stone brews, uh, the, the Levitation, the Arrogant Bastard. Uh, so I know they're really good. Anyway, let's get this one open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Ruin Tin by Stone here in the rather excellent drinking horn. And by the way, it's five pounds of hops. I finally had to look at the... Uh, the bottle uh, to see that. Um, I'd forgotten what it was. But anyways, five pounds of hops in this, so we'll see what kind of difference it makes as far as the taste. Now the, the smell is really, really nice. It sort of got that sort of uh, uh, sweaty socks in a, in a football locker. No, I'm just kidding. It's actually quite nice. It's got sort of chocolatey, coffee-like flavors, uh, aromas there. 
it's a lot more of a sort of coffee, chocolatey kind of smell. Um, seemed like a, maybe a little bit of a citrusy aroma as well, but anyway, let's give it a taste. Oh, now that is really potent, <laughs> really thick and uh, creamy ale here. It's a uh, it's got that sort of bitterness that you would, of course, expect from an IPA, but it's not too bad. 10% uh, alcohol or whatever, I uh, don't really taste that at all. I uh, just get that sort of uh, sort of a coffee slash uh, nutty kind of flavor that you get with an IPA. A little bit of a bitterness. Uh, this is definitely not something you would chug. <laughs> you know, this is a one that you'd want to nurse over the course of a night. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, I'm really torn, it tastes really nice, maybe I'll give it one more taste. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little bit bitterer than I really enjoy, so I'm going to go four out of five on this. If you do like a bitter, a bitter tasting ale, then this would be a five out of five, but not so much, uh, so I'm going to go four out of five drinking corns on this. But anyway, very, very good, high quality ale, definitely worth trying. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the quotation for this week comes from memory. <laughs> Thought I would tell you a little joke this, uh, uh, this time, a little story. It goes something like this. One bright morning in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, pulled their swords and shot each other. A deaf policeman heard the noise, got up and shot those two dead boys. And if you don't believe this lie is true, go ask the blind man. He saw it too. See you guys next week. One thing that puzzles me um, is the makeup of your audience. It seems to be uh, predominantly young boys.